If the goal is to optimize biological age, optimizing albumin is a good start. And that's because albumin is included in at least two blood-based biological age calculators, including Levine's biological age calculator as shown there, and also in aging.ai as shown there. Now, the reference range for albumin is 3.4 to 5.4 grams per deciliter or 34 to 54 grams per liter, but the reference range doesn't indicate whether higher or lower levels of albumin are optimal in terms of youth or health. So that'll be the focus of this video and also can albumin be improved? So first, how does albumin change during aging? So this is a study of about 1.1 million people and we're looking at serum levels of albumin on the y-axis plotted against age all the way up to 100 years old. And we can see that albumin levels decline during aging for both men and women. So how does albumin relate to risk of death for all causes? And that's what we can see here. So the hazard ratio for all cause mortality on the y-axis plotted against the concentration of albumin on the x. So first, lowest all-cause mortality risk was present for an albumin concentration of 46 grams per liter. But there is a range for the lowest risk. So starting with 45, which was defined as the reference, so that's a hazard ratio of 1.0. Then we can see for 46, the hazard ratio was 0.97, so a 3% reduced risk. And that's significant because we can see the data in parentheses, the 95% confidence interval was, was completely below one, so it's a significant uh, association. And then there wasn't data for 47 for albumin, but there was data for 48 in this paper. And uh, the, we can see the hazard ratio is 1.02, but the confidence interval overlaps with one. So that indicates that uh, having an albumin of 48 is not significantly different from 45. So that leads to the range for lowest risk being 45 to 48 grams per liter for albumin. So uh, if you remember the data from the previous slide, youthful levels of albumin are equal to the lowest all-cause mortality risk. So uh, looking at the age-related uh, data, we can see that peak values for women and men are 45 and 46 respectively, which fall into that range for lowest risk for all-cause mortality, 45 to 48. Now note that there is significantly increased risk when albumin is less than 45, but also when albumin is greater than 49. So first starting with the data for 49, we can see that that hazard ratio is 1.07, so a 7% increased risk for all-cause mortality. And we can see that the data, that, that the data in parentheses uh, does not overlap with one, so it's a significant association. And similarly for uh, an albumin of 51, we can see a 15% increased all-cause mortality risk. So when considering these data, we can see based on the aging and all-cause mortality data that optimal albumin is 45 to 48 grams per liter or 4.5 to 4.8 grams per deciliter. All right, so can the age-related decline for albumin be slowed or stopped? So let's have a look at my own N of 1 data. So I have 43 blood tests for albumin since 2005. Now, uh, when I first started tracking uh, blood biomarkers, I wasn't tracking diet. So from 2005 to 2013, I was just uh, going to the doctor about once a year and recording that data in an Excel spreadsheet. And that's what we can see here. And my average over those seven blood tests over that nine year period, uh, level of albumin was 4.74 grams per deciliter. Now in 2015, I had the idea to start diet tracking. So let's just take a quick look at that for people who haven't seen that approach who may be new to the channel. So uh, I've been weighing literally all of my food uh, since April of 2015 using a food scale. And then I entered those food amounts into chronometer. And I'm not here to say if chronometer is the best or not. This is just what I've used every day since 2015. There may be other apps that do a similar uh, thing, you know, uh, quantifying uh, food composition. Uh, but that's what I use. And if you're interested in a chronometer membership discount, uh, that will be in the video's description. Now I then take chronometer's data, data and enter it into a spreadsheet. And because I'm also tracking uh, blood biomarkers at the same time, I can calculate correlations between diet with the blood biomarkers. So now back to the data. And uh, I, I started blood testing way more often in uh, 2015, and my first blood test for albumin actually started in 2016. So over that uh, seven year period, 2015 to 2022, uh, my average albumin level is 4.94 grams per deciliter in 36 blood tests over that seven year uh, uh, span. Now, uh, when using a two sample t-test, we can see that these two groups of data are significantly different. So when compared with 2005 to 2013, I've been able to resist the age-related decline for albumin and have significantly increased it instead. Now, if you remember from the previous slide, optim optimal albumin is 45 to 48 grams per liter or 4.5 to 4.8 grams per deciliter. So uh, this would put my current average of albumin uh, at 4.94 
at a 7% increased all-cause mortality risk. So if relatively higher albumin is bad for health, I'd expect a net negative correlative score for albumin with big picture biomarkers. So let's take a look at a biomarker versus biomarker analysis, albumin versus other big picture biomarkers. And that's what we can see here. And without going too much into the what are the big picture biomarkers, as I've presented that in many other videos, uh, this is 23 biomarkers that are representative of many different organ systems. So how does albumin compare for its correlation with these biomarkers? So what we can see is that no blood biomarkers are significantly correlated with albumin. Uh, the only one that's even close is glucose uh, with a p-value of 0.06 and a positive correlation. So in other words, relatively higher albumin is, significantly, uh, is close to being significantly correlated with uh, higher glucose. But if the p-value is just outside statistical significance. So while the all-cause mortality data suggests that 4.9 may be suboptimal for albumin, there's no evidence in my data that 4.9 is too high. Now, that being said, on my latest test, which was in May, uh, you know, two, about two months ago, May of 2022, albumin is 4.8 grams per deciliter. So going forward, I'm going to try my best to limit some of the, the values that are higher than 5. You can see I've got a few values at 5, 5.2, even 5.4. So I'm going to try to limit those to try to stay closer to 4.8 and flatline my albumin. Uh, so that it's uh, right at that threshold for the uh, optimal range, 45 to 48, or 4.5 to 4.8. So I, no I noted that I've been able to resist the age-related decline for albumin. So how, how have I been able to do that? So as I mentioned, I have 36 blood tests for albumin since 2015 that correspond to diet. So I can then look at correlations for macro and micronutrients with albumin with the goal of optimizing albumin. So we can see that data here. So starting with macronutrients, and note that I've got oxalate uh, listed as a macronutrient. It's not a vitamin or a mineral, so there's no other place to put it. So I put it within the macronutrients, even though it's not a macronutrient. Nonetheless, we can see that none of these macronutrients are significantly correlated with albumin. Similarly, most of the vitamins are not significantly correlated with al albumin, and none of the vitamins uh, are significantly correlated with albumin. Now, the only two that are significantly correlated with albumin are vitamin A and beta carotene. Now note that uh, almost exclusively all of my va vitamin A intake comes from carotenoids, including beta carotene. So that significant correlation for vitamin A with albumin is likely driven only by beta carotene. So beta carotene from what? And this is a screenshot of chronometer data. This is uh, literally seven years. This is my average intake for the past seven years. And again, this is a screenshot of chronometer data. And we can see that my average beta, uh, daily beta carotene intake is about 55,000 micrograms or 55 milligrams per day. And I get it completely from whole food. This isn't from supplements. So uh, a couple quick things to note here. Uh, carrots are listed there twice and so is lettuce. And that's because unbeknownst to me, at some point in the past, I was entering raw carrots, for example, using two different uh, databases that are in chronometer, one of them being the Canadian database and the other being the US. So I did that un unknowingly for both carrots and lettuce. Nonetheless, we can see that the majority of my beta carotene intake comes from carrots, but also butternut squash, spinach, both raw and cooked, which I've since cut down to limit uh, oxalates, uh, or, uh, sweet potato, orange sweet potato, red bell pepper, uh, lettuce, and broccoli. So when considering beta carotene significant correlation with albumin, how much beta carotene is optimal to keep albumin in that 45 to 48 or 4.5 to 4.8 gram per deciliter range? So let's take a visual look at albumin versus beta carotene, which is what we can see here. So my, uh, and, and we've got the correlation that I just uh, put up on the screen. So my lowest intake for beta carotene has been around 33,000 micrograms per day or around 33 milligrams per day. And my highest beta carotene intake, and note that each of these dots corresponds to the average intake, average daily intake that corresponds to a blood test. So my highest beta carotene intake has been about 67 micrograms per day as shown there. With the average, as I noted on the previous slide, of about 55,000 micrograms per day or 55 milligrams per day. So if beta carotene intake causes higher albumin, and note that I'm not trying to say that correlation equals causation. I know that these are correlations. I don't know if this is causation. But if beta carotene is indeed causative, for higher albumin levels in my data. I can't say that this will be true for everybody else or anybody else. Should I eat as much beta carotene as possible with the goal of optimizing albumin? So superficially, the answer would be yes. If the goal is only to optimize albumin, that would be the answer. But will maximizing beta carotene intake optimize albumin but make other biomarkers worse? I don't wanna make one thing good and mess up three other things. 
But alternatively, maybe a higher beta carotene intake will optimize more things than it'll mess up. So how can we assess that? So let's take a look at correlations for beta carotene with big picture biomarkers. And again, this is my own individual data, N of 1 data. So we can see that here, correlate, correlations for beta carotene with big picture biomarkers. Uh, and just real quick, the little n is how many blood tests that I have for each of these biomarkers. The little r is the correlation. And the p-value is whether it's a significant correlation or not. So first, we can see that a significant correlation for beta carotene with albumin, so a relatively higher beta carotene intake is significantly correlated with higher albumin. But then note that a relatively higher beta carotene intake is significantly correlated with higher glucose, higher blood urea nitrogen, BUN, higher alkaline phosphatase, higher LDL, higher neutrophils, and monocytes, and a lower lymphocyte percentage. Now, in terms of how these uh, correlations look in terms of aging and all-cause mortality risk, these are all going in the wrong direction. For example, we don't want higher glucose or higher blood, higher blood urea nitrogen. Those are going in the wrong direction in terms of, in terms of aging and all-cause mortality risk. So when considering correlations for beta carotene with big picture biomarkers, I've got one going in the right direction, albumin, and seven going in the wrong direction to lead to a net correlative score of minus six. Now that suggests that I should not eat as much beta carotene as possible as it may optimize albumin, but make a lot of other stuff worse. So with that in mind, my current beta carotene intake that's corresponding to my next blood test, which will be in a few weeks, is uh, 50,000 micrograms per day, or uh, sorry, yeah, or 50 milligrams per day. Now note that that's purposely, purposely below my average intake of about 55,000 micrograms per day, as when I have a net negative correlative score, I aim for less than my average intake. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.